tune and turn over to page number 433. Page number 433. <clears throat> page to page number 431 page 431 Blessing over the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, for the blood you shed, the life you gave on the cross, Lord, to redeem us of our sins. Thank you, Lord, that where our sin did abound, your grace did much more abound. 
Thank you, Lord, that our salvation is a gift, but we can never, ever gain it on our own. We pray, Lord, as we hear the preaching of your word, you'll prepare our hearts for it, and that we will take what we hear, apply it to our lives, and share it with others. We pray, Lord, you'll help us to align our hearts with your word and with your will. We pray, Lord, that we will be encouraged through your word here today for that daily walk that we have with you. We pray, Lord, if there's one among us that has not accepted that gift of salvation, Lord, that you freely offer, that the day would be the day that they do so. Pray, Lord, you'll help us to rejoice in the name of the Lord here today. And we ask, Lord, you'll take this offering, bless it, multiply it, use it for your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. May be seated. Let's all stand together and turn over to page number 427. Page 427, and after the first verse, we'll go around and greet each other, welcome each other to the house of the Lord this morning.
start making their way back to their seats will be at page number 427 on that last verse. Turn over to page number 428. Oh. <laughs> page 428. It came upon the midnight clear. Let's do uh, page number 243. One more this morning, page 243. Let's all stand together for this one.
Amen. If you remain standing, just switch books. <clears throat> I'll invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 2 this morning. <clears throat> Isn't it great to be at God's house on Christmas? Amen. Appreciate you all being here so much. <clears throat> and looking forward to just some good reminders, just things we want to be able to go over just a little bit <clears throat> this morning from Matthew chapter number 2. Matthew 2 and beginning in verse number 1. You found your place? Say amen. amen. All right. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule, by, uh, rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them unto Bethlehem, and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also." When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. I want to bring our message this morning of have you come to see the King? Have you come to see the King? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great privilege it is just to be able to be here this morning. We thank you for your love for us, Lord. We thank you for coming to this earth to, to live a perfect sinless life, to die on the cross for us, to be raised again from the grave. Lord, we're so thankful to have a risen Savior. And as we think about this Christmas day, I pray, Father, that you would just tender our, our hearts to all that you have accomplished. And I pray, Lord, that we truly see you as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, if there's one here that's never trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, I pray that today would be the day that it's not just a religious moment, but I pray, Father, that they would see the great need for Christ and that they would receive you. Thank you for your wonderful love for us and for allowing us the privilege of being able to gather this morning. We just commit this time to your hands, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. I love the question that the wise men pose there. He says, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Now, he is not asking Herod that, that question whenever it's there. They're coming into town and they're saying, where's, uh, where's the one that is born king of the Jews? Well, it doesn't take long uh, before the word gets back to Herod. You can imagine if you were in town and, and here's these wise men and, they say, and you know, they, they're hearing, hey, where's the king? Oh, well, Herod's over here. No, no, I'm looking for the king of the Jews. Which one is born king of the Jews? And so uh, this word gets around to Herod and and obviously this thing is causing quite a stir. They're seeking after the, the real king, the king of kings. I mean, this is the king that in verse number 2 says he's got his own star. Amen. Verse number 2 says this is the king that has the right to be worshipped. And with all that, whenever it comes around to Herod, then it says in verse number 3 that Herod was troubled. He was troubled at, at what was going on, and rightly so. Uh, Herod, uh, Herod the Great was not royalty. They're asking, uh, where's the one that was born king? Herod was not born king. Herod was a good military leader. They don't take anything away from Herod. Uh, but, but that's not, uh, he, he was not born king. He, because of his military conquest, he was appointed as being a king by Rome. They looked and said, we need somebody that's going to be over Judea. And, uh, and so uh, make sure that, uh, that, that we get the right guy there. So that's who it is that they put. Uh, Herod was a foreigner. Uh, he was not of the people. So in his time of rule, you think about this, no wise men ever came to town saying, we would sure like to worship the king. You know, that's got to stir you up just a little bit. Can you imagine it? Just kind of put yourself in Herod's shoes here. I know we don't like to do that. <laughs> but, uh, but if you were Herod, hey man, yeah, here it is, your whole life, man, it's been military. Uh, you've got all the conquests. You've got all the victories. Now all of a sudden you've got the attention of Rome. They're putting you in charge. You're called King Herod. And then nobody comes to worship. 
But then all of a sudden, here's these guys, and they're coming into town saying, where's the one who was born king of the Jews? We're coming to, to worship him. So he's seeing this as a legitimate threat. And by the way, uh, it also says in verse number three, it wasn't just Herod was troubled. It said all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. That seems kind of odd, doesn't it? I mean, Jerusalem was supposed to be the city of David. You got the whole genealogy in chapter 1 was, was coming to the point where the, the Messiah was going to come through the kingly line of David. Bethlehem was the birthplace of Jesus. But Jerusalem was the birthplace of Judaism. So, so why would they be troubled? Whenever Jesus came into his public ministry at, at 30 years old, you remember the people were looking for a deliverer. They wanted to find a king. They, they needed a king, but they were looking for somebody from a, a military standpoint, from a governmental standpoint that would deliver them from the tyranny of Rome. That's what they were, they were looking for. But whenever Jesus was born, they weren't looking yet. Instead, just the thought of these things, it was troubling to all of Jerusalem. You ever think about that? Why is that? Why would the, the birth of the Savior, the birth of the King, why would it be troubling to the people that were supposed to be delivered? Why is it? It's because they had let godless behavior prevail long enough, it got rooted in. It became their whole uh, point of life. That's what they were living for. And likely, all of Jerusalem knew that whenever the Messiah did come, there was going to be a lot of things that were going to, to be affected. There was going to be uprisings. There was going to be wars. There were going to be a lot of uh, extra fears that were going on. There's going to be social unrest. There's going to be economic problems. There's going to be this power struggle. The price of diesel is going to go through the roof. I mean, they're looking at all of these different, different things. And they would prefer to not upset the apple cart. They just like to keep things going the way that it's been. They'll just ride it out and see how things go. You know, that's not God's plan. Amen? That's not what God has in mind. By the way, God never has that in mind in your life either. Uh, whenever you think about your own personal walk uh, on this earth, He never just wants to say, well, let's just kind of coast things through and see what happens. Let's just kind of hope for the best. No, God says, I sent my only begotten Son. I mean, I, 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 He sent Jesus to be able to come to this sin-cursed earth so that we could know the abundance of salvation, the abundant life in Christ. And He said, the last thing that you ever want to do is just coast things through. Just kind of hope for the best, be a little religious on the side. That's not, that's not God's plan. God does not share His throne. Amen. Herod, he may have been a mighty military leader, but he also knew that he didn't know all the fine details of the Word of God. He didn't know what was going on. And so you get down to verse number four, it says, when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together. I like that. The chief priests, or the, the uh, chief priest and the scribes of the people, not just his, but of the people. He gathered them together and he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Now, I like this. Uh, you think about Herod here. Herod never said, is there any truth to this? He didn't call all the religious leaders together and say, is this really right? I mean, is there really going to be a Messiah that was born? He never questioned if the Messiah was going to be born. He said, where's this supposed to go down? Where's this supposed to be happening? He understood that it was, it was there. It was not a question uh, of if, it was a question of where. He wanted to know what the Scriptures had to say about it. So, so he calls the religious officials together as his counsel. Now, here's some men, we'll see this in a minute, but they didn't really love God. They had a lot of understanding. They were religious, they were intellectual, but their love wasn't really there. But, but they could answer the question for him. So they quoted the prophet Micah in verses 5 and 6. They said unto him, he said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written uh, by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people, Israel. So in the little bit of time that we got this morning, I just want to kind of put herself in that same position as the wise men. I want to ask the same question, have you come to see the king? Have you come to see the king? All of these things are shaping out a lot of details that are happening here. There's a lot of things that's going on in Herod's life, a lot of things that's going on in Jerusalem, a lot of things that's going on certainly in Mary and Joseph's life. They've got all of these different details that are happening. God's working in the midst of it. But we can't get past the point of asking, did, did we come to see the king? You know, today it's so easy to get distracted by all the busyness of the day. So, we, man, this is, this is Christmas Day and you're in church, and I applaud you for that. But I understand there's probably stuff that you got planned right after church. 
I know you got family gatherings. There's, there's gifts and things like that. If you hadn't done it, it's probably coming. There's, there's all kinds of different things that's going on. There's traveling that's happening. But you made this time to come into the house of God. But not just to come into the house of God. You need to see the king. We want to be able to recognize who Jesus is. What it is that he came to do. And that's what you see in this life. These wise men, they knew that the king was to be sought. They knew that the king was to be sought. And verse number 6, we just read that the, the prophet Michael was quoted about the location of Jesus' birth. But there was more testified about in Scripture. Verse number 2 tells us very plainly, it says, this was the birth of the king. Now, this is pretty awesome whenever you think about Jesus here. Jesus was different than any other. His life didn't begin whenever he was born. Amen? That's hard to get your brain around. That's one of those things that, yeah, yeah, we got it, but, but we, don't, we don't really got it. We don't really understand it the way that it is. In John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he goes on in verse 14, it says, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The birth of Jesus Christ was the birth of one who already existed. This was the birth of the Creator. This is the birth of the one who created birth. Amen? I mean, get your head around that one. It was a, this was a time of humbling in which Jesus left the very glory and splendors of heaven to be made in the likeness of men. He left His eternal home. He came to a sin-cursed world. Why? To be our Redeemer. Man, you, you, should, you should never get over that. He should have been sought after. He should have been the number one priority just to be able to hear. Whenever wise men came and said, where is the king of the Jews? Man, they should have just fell out right there. But they were busy. They had things that were going on. They had other, other things that preoccupied their mind. He should have been sought after. But by and large, what you see is that for the most part, he was just kind of unexpected. He wasn't planned for. I can imagine how the people would have largely given up on the coming of the Messiah. There had been, uh, if you were to put yourself in their position, there had been such an extended uh, point of silence from God. If you would have, if you'd uh, wonder if God was concerned about you, you know, after that amount of time. If you, if you hadn't heard from God for, for, for all these uh, centuries of time, where there hasn't been a direct relation to, from, by a prophet to the people, you'd probably wonder, it's like, I wonder if we just pushed it too far. I wonder if God said, enough is enough, and he's tired of messing with us. Maybe the people thought they'd really blown it. God wasn't going to help them anymore. But you know, it's interesting, whenever you start out in chapter number 1, we won't go through it all, but those first 17 verses goes through the very genealogy. And it's there to, to build us up to the, the coming of Jesus. You know, it's interesting because whenever you start thinking about the, the, the thoughts that they may have had, maybe we, maybe we took it too far, maybe we blew it, and yet you start going through the genealogies and you find people in Jesus' past like Rahab, the harlot. You find Bathsheba that in verse 6 is mentioned as the, the former wife of Urias. That genealogy is a reminder that the Lord always delivers. The Lord always keeps His promises. Amen? Amen. At a time whenever the people of this world are so set to make something of themselves, we need to remember the king. He humbled himself to be a servant. We remind ourselves that we're to be like Christ. We're supposed to be, that's what Christian means, amen? So, well, I'm Christian, are you? Because it means to be like Christ, to follow him. It's, you know, it's, uh, in what way? It's not within us to be able to have the kind of power to raise the dead, to heal the sick. We can't cause the blind to see. You and I cannot forgive sin. Amen. How can we be like Christ? There is something you can do. You can humble yourself to the will of God. That's what Jesus did. God promised Abraham that in his lineage all the world would be blessed. He promised to raise up a Savior from the family of David, and God kept his word. And it was evident. How do we know? Jesus came. Amen. It was a fulfillment of prophecy. He, he promised Joseph back in Matthew 1.21, he says, She shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. As you read through the Gospels, you start seeing, uh, wh why was it that Jesus came? He gave some very specific things that he would accomplish whenever he came to this earth. Remember Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 
Mark 10, 45, Jesus said that the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. In John 9, 39, Jesus said, For judgment I am come into the world, that they which see not might see. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. In John 10, in verse number 10, Jesus said, The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. He said, I am come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. That's pretty amazing. Then you got Herod. Herod couldn't do any of those things. He was, he was an appointed king. He was a man-made king. But he couldn't do the things that only the true king could do. No wonder the wise men are looking for him. Amen? No wonder they said, we're, we're willing to drop everything else. We're willing to walk the long distance. We're willing to bring gifts. We're willing to do all of this. We're, we're, we're willing to come and worship him. Because no earthly person could ever do what Jesus did. Jesus was the answer for all of mankind. The rest of the world, think about, think about this. Just, you know, the rest of the world is like those saying, no room in the inn. No room in the inn. But the wise men were different. As soon as they heard of the king's coming, they sought him out. They wanted to meet him. They wanted to be a part of what was going on. You know, that's still a, a mark of true wisdom today. It's not just knowing that he came. Amen? Oh, listen, we are, we are in the south. Amen? I should have gotten most of you. Amen? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, you've got the privilege of, of being able to go into church and, and hear the Word of God preached and understand that Jesus did come. But it's one thing to be able to, to just know it in our, in our head and, and, and knowing the story and knowing about what Christmas is, knowing what Easter is. It's something else to want to meet Him. Oh, boy, that's the desire of the heart. That's still that mark of real wisdom. It's wanting to know him personally. The wise men knew that he is to be sought. They also knew that he is to be received. They knew that he is to be received. Now look at what they say in verse number 2. It says, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. You know, that's a prevalent thought. If you look down to verse number 8, Herod's talking here kind of deceptively, but look at what he says. He says, uh, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Why would he tell the wise men that he wanted to go worship other than just being a deceiver? Well, he knows that that's what you're supposed to do. Whenever you understand that this is the king of kings that has just been born, whenever you see this is the king of his people, this is the Messiah come to earth, he says, there's no other response that you, he, he didn't say, well, I, you know, I want to send a token, you know, let me know where he's at because I've got these great people that make fruit baskets, it's going to be wonderful. You know, he's like, no, he says, I'll come and worship him so, or two. And again, he was, he was being deceptive. But that was the point. That's what it was that he was supposed to be doing. The wise men knew that the king was worthy of worship, and they weren't the only ones. You know, throughout the account of Jesus' birth, it's interesting. I love, uh, I love what God does in His Word, in that He puts all these relationships together. You know, our, our whole life, boy, it's made interesting through the relationships. Amen? It's one thing to be able to say, I say, well, I wake up, uh, I go to work, uh, then I, I come home, and then I go to bed. And, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. But that's not it. Uh, you wake up, and you've got relationships at home. You go, to, you go to work, you've got relationships at work. Some of them are there to try you. Amen? Others, uh, they're there, man, it's like, I, I don't think I could make it through the day if I didn't have, you know, a, a work friend that we're on the same page with. That's just a blessing to be able to, I mean, you spend however many hours a day at work. It's good to be able to have somebody that you're in agreement with. Amen? And then you come home. Guess what you got at home? Relationships. You got other people that you're going uh, uh, to, to, to correspond with. You're going to be talking about you. You're going to be sharing those things. Boy, uh, the, the relationships make your life. And that's true in the Word of God as well. Uh, you're missing out on something if you're just looking at dates and times and measures. Uh, all of you probably had some kind of history class in school. If you're like mine, it was horrible. Absolutely horrible. I love history now. But whenever we were in school, I remember Kim and I have had this conversation. Why did I hate history so much? And sorry if you're a history teacher or something. No. <laughs> but it was horrible. Why was that? It was because the whole point of history was they would say, memorize this date and shut up. You know, don't talk because it was the coach that was teaching the history class. 
That was it. You know, they just had to, by default, they had to be there. They were either going to teach health science or history, you know, and that was, that was it. Just sit down, don't ask me anything, memorize the date. Right, that's not the way it is, man. It's, it's relationships. And you start looking through Scripture, and there's all these relationships all around Jesus. It's not just about the date and the time. No, it's about what was happening with the people. I talked about Joseph just recently. Think about what Jesus meant to Joseph. Joseph was a carpenter. He's a man, he worked a trade. Honest living, from what we understand about Joseph. Not a rich man, but at least he's honest. He was a kind man, for sure. Remember, before he knew that his betrothed wife was pregnant with the Son of God, he thought that maybe she had cheated on him. The thought came to his mind, he said, well, I'll put her away privily. He wasn't going to make a public spectacle out of her. He didn't want her to be stoned and killed. But he was a kind-hearted man. But this kind-hearted man, in all of his good works and good heart, good deeds, he needed a Savior. Jesus was going to be born. He was going to die on the cross so that good men like Joseph could be saved. What about Mary? I mean, Mary, she was a, she was a young, godly girl. Some people worship Mary. Certainly she was a wonderful young lady. Heart of gold, godly, knew the scriptures. I hate to break it to you, she was not without sin. She needed a Savior as well. She confessed that Jesus was the only way that she was going to be able to get to heaven. Luke 1, verse 46 and 47, Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. She said, I need a Savior. She recognized whenever Jesus was going to be born, she says, this is the birth of my Savior. This is, this is God's Son. The wise men who came to worship, they needed a Savior. Not much is known about the wise men. They've, they've been the subject of a lot of speculation as to where they were from and what they really did and how far they came. And I mean, there's all these, all these things that they, people wonder about. Some say that they were astronomers because they're watching the stars and seeing those things. Maybe something to that, because I don't know how many times I've walked around at night and I hadn't looked up yet, you know. Every now and then we're like, wow, that's something. You know, I need to go on. You know, I didn't look. I said, that one looks different. You know, I, I, I think it would have to be something pretty amazing to be able to recognize that that's something that you're trained in, whatever. But, but they, they knew there was something that was going on there, and they came to Jerusalem. I love that. They came to Jesus. How, how do you know they were wise? They came to Jesus, Amen. That's a mark of wisdom. The angels, remember, uh, we talked about just recently, the angels, they, they came to the shepherds of all people to announce the birth of Jesus. Shepherds didn't have the best of reputations. I know that's something that you don't see whenever you acted out in the kids' plays and things of that nature, but that usually wasn't the case. We often think about David, and we're like, wow, he was a shepherd. Man, David was great. He was. We, we consider them as good and faithful men who cared for sheep, devoted to their jobs, and yeah, that was true. They were hard workers, brave, but they were not always the most law-abiding citizens. In fact, it said during the days of Herod, their calling was at a low point. It was like, you know, you, well, you can't do anything else. Maybe you could shepherd. You know, that was kind of the, the way it was. You don't have anybody at home that's going to miss you. You might as well go abide in the, abide in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. Nobody's going to miss you at home. You know, I mean, that's kind of the way, the way it was. And yet it was a company of shepherds that the first announcement of Jesus' birth was made. Who were they? They were men who needed a Savior. What about Herod? That was a great relationship that we get to see. I mean, he's got good discourse here in the Bible. Herod was a ruler. He had a kingdom. He had servants. He had military leadership, so much so that it really consumed and took away his peace. He didn't have any peace about him. His pride, his selfish desire to be his own king drove him to that attempt to kill the Lord instead of worship him. He understood the deception that was there. He says, hey, you go and you find him. Whatever you find him, you, you come back and tell me because I want to show up and worship him too. Can you imagine what's going on in the heart of Herod to be able to say, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's just, he's just lying to the wise men. He doesn't know anything about what's going on. He's got his own counsel coming in saying, hey, where's this Jesus going to be born? They tell him. The wise men come. They're looking. He's trying to find. He says, uh, whenever you find him, you come back because I want to worship him too. Can you imagine the turmoil whenever in your heart? you know that what you want to do is kill him? Man, that would be rough. That's, a, that's an absence of peace. Why did Jesus come? So that men like Herod could be saved. 
Think about those religious leaders that Herod calls together. Look at it again, verse number 4, chapter 2 says, When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. They knew where the Messiah would come from. They knew it. They had the answer for him. They knew what the prophet had to say, but they didn't care enough to be looking for his coming. And whenever they became aware, think about this, these are the religious leaders, they said, well, let me tell you where it is that he's supposed to be born. According to Micah, this is what's going on. Oh, here's some wise men. They see the star in the east. They recognize that, that, the, that the king is born, and they want to find him. Guess what they did? Nothing. You would think if they already had some, some biblical understanding about what was going on, and somebody said, it is here, they would actually desire to follow him to go see for themselves. But they stayed where they were. You know, many people are just like that today, aren't they? They never respond to truth. There's a lot of people that will go to hell with a head full of Scripture because they wouldn't receive the Savior. Jesus Christ is the Savior for all of mankind. He's the Savior for good men, for lawless men, for the religious young and the religious old, for wise men that come, for the poor. He's the Savior. He was born to be the sacrifice for all. But knowing it doesn't save you. He has to be received. The wise men knew. Hey, the, the king is to be sought, the king is to be received, and lastly the king was to be worshipped. Look at what it says in verse number 9. It says, When they had <coughs> heard the king they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. I love that phrase. They rejoiced with, they didn't just rejoice. Amen. It says they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. You ever think about that? What makes the difference? What makes the difference between it's like, well, I got some regular joy. I just got regular. I didn't get high octane exceeding great joy. What, what is it that actually makes the difference between regular joy and exceeding great joy? Here it is. It's the personal recognition. It's the personal recognition. Uh, you might uh, know somebody, <clears throat> maybe it's a soldier that's coming home for the holidays. If you see a soldier coming home for the holidays, there's, a, uh, there's joy for them. Amen. You're happy for them. Say, so, oh, my so-and-so's coming in. Great. Oh, I'm glad. I've had that conversation this week several times. That's great. I I'm glad they're able to come in. I'm, I'm glad that you're getting to spend that time together. Oh, we're going to have Christmas together. What, you know, oh, that's, that's wonderful. You know what makes it exceeding great joy? It's whenever it's your soldier. Whenever it's your child that's been gone for months, and all of a sudden they come in the door. I know I'm not the only one. I love the YouTube videos. The soldiers coming home. And I'm over there going. <laughs> what is that? They, Mom and dad didn't even know they were coming. And all of a sudden they walk in the door. They, I always love it whenever they're at the restaurant. They just kind of come up with the, with the person's fries. You know, it's like, here you go. Ah! <laughs> right there, mama has exceeding great joy. That's real rejoice. Why? It's personal. It's personal. The wise men knew what the birth of the Lord meant. There's other times in the Bible, <clears throat> I started looking up that phrase. I, I wonder where else it talks about exceeding great. Exceeding great. It's an interesting phrase. I started looking it up this week. I'll give you just a couple. Second Chronicles 16, verse number 12, it talked about the disease of, of Asa. The disease of Asa was exceeding great. I find it interesting. Where was that disease? His feet. So what's the significance of that? You know, I was thinking about the, uh, the, the tabernacle. Whenever the priest would, would minister in the tabernacle, you remember they had the brazen altar, and then they had the brazen laver, and then they would get into the holy place. That was the covered area that was there, and they would minister for the people, and that's where they would uh, offer the, the, the sacrifice and offer the incense and all that. They had the altar of incense there and the, the lampstand and the showbread and all those things that were there. But every time, whenever the priest would walk by uh, from the brazen altar, before they would go into the 
the holy place there, they had to pass by the brazen laver. And that brazen laver was not just for the washing of the hands, but it was for the washing of the feet also. And they would walk whenever they would go through uh, from, the, from the brazen altar into the holy place. They would stop and they would wash their hands and they would wash their feet and then they would go on in and they would minister. And then whenever they were coming out of the holy place and they were coming back for another offering, they were coming back to the altar, they would stop again and they would wash their hands and they would wash their feet. Why would they be washing their feet whenever they've been ministering in the holy place and they're going back to the altar? Because where they're ministering is still dirt. Dirt floor. They've got all the gold and silver, they've got all the stones, everything, but, but the floor itself is a dirt floor. And the more that they're just walking about, just ministering, what happens? All of a sudden they start getting a lot of dirt on them. The same thing happens to you and I. You may know Christ is Savior, but the more that you're out in the world, you know what happens? The, the dirt of the world just kind of keeps heaping up on you. That comes by the point, what, how, how do you get cleansed from that? Well, the Bible talks about that washing of water by the Word. Shows you the things that are there. Now, uh, anyway, all that's going on with the feet. Asa had this exceeding great disease about the feet. Ezekiel 9, verse number 9, tells about the children of Israel. It says, uh, Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. Isn't that something? He's talking about sin. He says, why this, this sin of the, the people, it's exceeding great. And it goes on, it says, and the land is full of blood and the city full of perverseness. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth and the Lord seeth not. I said, man, God ain't even looking. God's not looking. I'll just do whatever. And he says, the perversion that was going on in the people was so much. He said, their sin, their iniquity was exceeding great. No wonder whenever the wise men heard about the birth of the Messiah, that the God in the flesh had come, they said, this is exceeding great. They joined with exceeding great. Why? Because they understood that the sin was exceeding great. They understood that the Savior had to be exceeding great. I mean, he, he had to be able to meet the need of the world. And that was the answer of Jesus. Peter was talking about Jesus in 2 Peter chapter number 1, verses 3 and 4. He says, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Jesus is your answer. That's the answer to the sin of the world. We look around and say, oh, it's horrible. Of course it is. It's the world. But Jesus is great. He is exceeding great. These wise men had exceeding great joy at the sight of the star. Isn't that great? Man, here they are. They look, and he says, go find them. All right, there's the star. And they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. If you think about that, they, hadn't even seen the, they haven't even seen the Lord yet. And yet they're overflowing with joy. Why? Because it was the promise of his arrival. They knew that that's exactly what God said he was going to do. Imagine what they do whenever they saw Jesus himself. I mean, if they'll have exceeding great joy over the star, what about the Lord? Tells us, look at it, verse 11. Verse 11, you're still awake? Say amen. It says, and when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down, and what did they do? They worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. They fell down on their face and worshipped him. They even brought gifts, amen. Not a white elephant gift. <laughs> Not something at the trinket shop outside of town. We didn't think about that, man. We've got to get something. I mean, they planned ahead. It was a sacrificial gift. It testified of where they held the real value. It wasn't the things of this world. That's the way it is for the believer today. Whenever you see the promises of God that are contained in the Word of God, it gives you exceeding great joy. How is that? There's an understanding that there's a joy in knowing that the Lord came to this earth. There's a joy because of the promises of God. But you know, He lived a perfect sinless life. There's joy in knowing that He is the one and only sacrifice for every sin that you've ever committed. There's joy whenever you understand that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord.
There's joy in understanding that this salvation doesn't come by working harder at it, going to church enough times, turning over a new leaf. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is to be received. There's joy in knowing that. There's joy in knowing that not only did Jesus come, that he lived a perfect, sinless life, but also that he rose from the grave. Amen. We have a risen Savior. But when we see him, when we see him, the joy is going to turn to perfect praise and worship. Nobody's going to see Jesus and go give him a high five. You're going to fall on your face before him. You're going to worship him for who he is, what he came to do, what was accomplished. As much as we can rejoice that Jesus came into this world, we can rejoice with exceeding great joy knowing that he is coming again. The wise men, they had a star. They had a star that testified of his first coming. What do we have? We have the inerrant word of God that gives us the truth that he's coming again. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior today, I'd like to invite you to him. Not just to see him, but to receive him as your personal Savior. Every person here, whatever your walk of life is, doesn't matter if I can look around, I can pick out different, different professions, different, uh, different age groups, all these type of things. The one thing that we have in common, we're all sinners. We all need a Savior. And Jesus came to pay the debt for you. If you don't know Him, come see Him today. If you need a church home, well, what a great place to be established, growing in the Word of God. Amen? Let's stand together. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. This will be your opportunity to respond. Father, we want to thank you so much for this day that you've given. We thank you, Lord, that you allow us to be able to gather together on a Christmas day. Lord, just to be able to have a refresher of the thoughts and the things that you lay before us of, of your coming. We're so very thankful for that. So thankful, Lord, that you are truly the sacrifice for our sin. Lord, that it wasn't just a babe in a manger, but it was the Lamb of God. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for the great gift of salvation. And I ask you, Lord, if there's one here that's never received Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior, I pray, Lord, that you would show them their need. Lord, that they would do just as you did and humble themselves and just come and receive you. Father, I pray that you would have your will and way in all the hearts of believers in this day. Lord, today's a day where we need to be reminded afresh and anew that you are to be, you're to be the most important one in our life. And all the events of this day help us to be mindful and keep our eyes upon you. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and love. Thank you for all that you do for us. We pray that you would accomplish your perfect will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Page number two, seven.